Section 8.3, Covalent Bonding. If two elements are going to form a bond, they've got to overcome a lot of problems. You've got negatives here in the, in the electron cloud, and there's electrons here, and these electrons are going to repel each other. Likewise, you're going to have positive charges in the nucleus, and these positive charges are going to repel each other as well. So if they are going to make a bond, they are going to have to come close enough together that the positives in the nucleus attract the electron cloud of the other atom more than they repel the nucleus of the other atom. So they've got to come together at a certain distance to where that's eff effective in sharing the electrons, but not too close or too far away. If they're too far away, then their electrons aren't being shared at all. If it's too close, then there's a repulsive force by the electrons to electrons in each in the uh, each atom and the nucleus to the nucleus of each atom. So if they can come together at a certain distance, then they're going to share the electron and you're going to end up with a cloud. So let's put it here, a cloud of electrons here that both nucleus is going to be attracted to. The nucleus on the left will be attracted to that cloud of electrons, and the nucleus on the right will also be attracted to that cloud, and so it acts like glue. So the, the bond pair, the pair of electrons, the bonding pair of electrons, are acting like glue to stick the two uh, atoms together. The distance that they, that they have, the bond length that you see all the time between two elements, are always going to be different based upon the, what is being connected with what. So a hydrogen-hydrogen will always have a bond length of 74 picometers because that is the optimum distance to where the bonding electrons are being attracted to the nucleus, but the repulsions between the electrons in each atom and the nucle nucleus in each atom is minimi minimized. So the the bond length is the, is the size of the attraction between the two atoms. So how close are they together? That is a mathematical sweet spot, if you want to think of it that way. It's the place to where it's enough to make it a bond, but not too much to have the repulsion between the, the nucleus and the other electrons to each other. So if you have a covalent bond, the molecule that's formed is called a covalent compound. So the compound is just more than one thing. Normally a compound is going to be a um, two or more substances. This is an example of a molecule of fluorine. So a covalent, it's a molecule. Molecules normally are covalent. So you can have a molecule of fluorine, but a covalent compound normally having more than one uh, type of matter that's coming together. The electron dot, uh, Lewis dot uh, structures are very easy with covalent bonds. They simply take the pairing electron that's being shared and replaces it with a line. So if I were to have uh, fluorine, and I have fluorine is seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and here is a fluorine again because I'm making a fluoride or a fluorine gas compound, well, these two guys are the ones that are being shared, and so this is how you draw it. You draw the electrons as, the bonding electrons as a line, and then the non-bonding electrons as dots. So this would be the Lewis dot structure of, FL, of F2. It is possible to not draw in the dots and just show that Obviously, it's in group seven. There has to be seven. It's only sharing two. That means the other, the other six have to be around the fluorine. So it's a like a supposed or an, uh, just a expected. Most of the most of the atoms that form covalent bonds with each other are nonmetals, and nonmetals, if you remember, are in the upper right corner of the periodic table. So hydrogen it counts as well. Hydrogen is in group one. But hydrogen is non-metal and acts like a non-metal. 
So hydrogen and oxygen forming water, that's a covalent bond. They're going to share those electrons. And so when you have um, group six, like oxygen's group six, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, you have two uh, non-binding pairs, lone pairs, they're called lone pairs. And then this guy is easy to form an, a bond with. So when you share an electron with that hydrogen or share an electron with this hydrogen, you've got a bond. And the space sharing model kind of looks like this to where this is the idea that this, um, I need a different color, this is the sphere of the hydrogen and it's overlapping with the sphere of the oxygen. So that overlap part is where they're sharing the electrons. So the top example A is ammonia. So you have nitrogen and three hydrogens. Well, ni nitrogen is in group five. That means it has one lone pair. So when you, when you put five around it and you can only make doubles, then you're going to have one lone pair that doesn't bond with anything. And then three single electrons that will easily bond with something like hydrogens. So when you make one, two, three, you end up with an NH3 molecule. And that's a cleaning ammonia, like glass cleaner. Um, methane is CH4, okay, CH4 is methane, where carbon is in, has four in its outer shell, and it's sharing one with each of the hydrogens. The hydrogen counts two of these for its stability. Remember, it only needs up to two. It doesn't need octet. It just needs a duet. The hydrogens do. But the carbon needs an octet, and by sharing with four, it has eight electrons, and that's an octet. That's methane, natural gas. Diamond is very unusual because it's sharing not it's sharing with four other carbons. So because it's sharing with four other carbons, it's in a it's like the monkey bars. It's all rigid and um, holding in a in a in a matrix structure such that e that even light diffracts in it. It's so th it's such a thick substance that it even bends light, say more than glass or more than anything. That's why the the colors in a diamond are so crazy because, because of the thickness of this due to its strong, rigid structure. Otherwise, it would be just like your pencil lead. It's exactly the same stuff. Your pencil lead and, and a diamond ring is made out of identical stuff. If you share more than one electron pair, then you have more than a single bond. So if you were to have two electrons pairs being shared here, that's called a double bond. So a double bond would be one, two, three, four. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it count that both of those electrons count for both sides. So carbon dioxide are two sets of double bonds, very rigid. Uh, nitrogen, uh, N2 nitrogen. Um, Nitrogen like is 70% of your air that you breathe, but it doesn't do anything. Like when you take it, when you breathe in nitrogen, it doesn't have any effect physiologically on your body because it is so tight. These three bonds are so tight that it's very unreactive. It really doesn't react with very much. So when you have a double bond or a single bond or a triple bond, the bond length will be different. The more electrons you're sharing, the tighter that bond is. And the tighter the bond is, the more or less, or in this case less, reactive that that stuff will be. Like nitrogen being very unreactive as a gas, it's almost it's an inert gas. It doesn't even do anything. Inert means nothing. It doesn't do a thing. So whereas you have 148 picometers for a single bond in oxygen, if you have a double bond in oxygen, it's only 121, so it's a lot shorter because it's a stronger bond. They're holding each other tighter. When you get into a triple bond, it's even less.